Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Back for a very long delayed video series that I have been putting off because, well, I'll be honest, I've been quite nervous about editing this footage. The footage you're about to see was filmed back in about 2018, I want to say. And yeah, the title, Haunted MVS Repairs, yeah, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is why I've not been able to bring myself to edit it. There were a few things that happened. These boards, as you'll see, were in a really, really, really bad state. But uh, yeah, some strange things happened around the time I was actually doing these. And the previous six boards that you can see here that were part of this same series, they all came from Mike Pearman. As you'll see, they were in a sorry state. There was a lot of work involved on these two boards. And one of those boards there had massive audio problems. And it was that specific board where it was at one point, this is where the problem started, where the board was on the mat, there was no cartridge installed, yeah? So if you know anything about the sound hardware on the Neo Geo, the YM2610, it takes its sound samples, PCM data, from the cartridge. There was no cartridge on there. And I powered it on, and this is where strange things happened, and I didn't capture this, but I'll uh, do an artist's impression. I powered it on, and the sound hardware proceeded on its own, with no cartridge in, no diagnostics wrong or anything, just to stop BIOS. It went die, 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 which, uh, yeah, disturbed me. I switched it off and I was like, how did that happen? And I switched it back on and there was nothing. There was no sound. Yeah, and then I continued through the repair on that one, then went back to the boards you're going to see in this series. Now you may think, well, I don't know, that's a bit odd. I, I can't explain that. There's no, there was no ROM. There was no ROM there to get PCM data. How does the sound hardware do that? The actual fault with the sound hardware, I forget exactly what it turned out to be, but even after I worked that out, I still couldn't understand how it could make sound that was sounded very clearly like the word die repeated over and over and over, which was strange. And you may think, well, it's just one of those weird random things that life, you know, presents to you. You know, weird electronic things no one can explain. It's just, you know, an odd sort of thing. Well, that night, that same very night, I was walking up the stairs, taking some food and a drink for my wife, who was uh, not well in bed. And for the first time in the, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 years of being in this house, I tripped on the top step because my hands were full. I had nothing, to, no way to sort of stop myself from going forward. So I went head first into the wall, the top of my head, indented the wall. <laughs> it's a cranial shaped hole in the wall from the top of my head uh, yeah and i had concussion and following that i then i started have problems with my leg the leg problems i had to go for all sorts of specialist tests and things you couldn't work it out and, and my head seemed all right at the time and my neck but i had this weird problem that started with my leg long story short uh, a month or so later i started to come to review the footage for the videos you're about to see here and i seem to have recorded what does to me sound like an EVP. In my own personal life, paranormal things have happened once or twice where you're just like, that's a bit weird, I can't really explain that. It must be, you know, law of averages, weird things can happen, the scientific reasons for things happening. But I couldn't understand how there was a, what sounds like a voice on the end of one of my recordings here, one of the clips. Anyway, well, you'll see that when you get to it. The bottom line is those few things all then led up to me losing my job and my leg problems getting worse and worse and worse. It was around that time I lost my job, I could barely walk. It's like I couldn't walk more than about 20 or 30 metres without having to stop in absolute agonising pain. So yeah, everything just went absolutely crap in my life at that point. Um, and thanks to all you guys and gals, actually, you know, that you helped me basically find a way forward. And my boss, uh, Simon, my new boss, Simon, a friend of mine, and he helped me by offering me some part-time work in his organisation. And, you know, he's a really good guy. He really is. A, he was a lifesaver. But you guys and gals have also been the other 50% of that equation and been a lifesaver for my channel. I wouldn't have been able to keep doing my channel if it wasn't for all the Patreon and coffee donations and people sending me things and supporting me the way you have. So, honestly, my heart goes out to every one of you people, no matter how what you've supported me with, whether it was just a dollar for a few months, you know what, I, I, I absolutely cannot thank you enough for the support. The bottom line is though, yeah, that you all helped me turn my life around at that point and you know, things are good going well, but I still felt pretty anxious about editing this video because it was, like I say, it led towards a really bad patch in my life and I still do have some leg problems to this day, to be fair, intermittently. 
and I've been having pins and needles and problems with my hands as well. I don't know, I still don't know whether it, it all comes back to that trip at the top of the stairs and hitting the head. But it was those two events, the, uh, you know, die, 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 followed by me falling and nearly killing myself at the top of the stairs. And then discovering footage that same afternoon where there was nobody else in the house. Yeah, my wife was away at the point where the uh, EVP was recorded there which was around that time, it was like within the same few days or something, it was around that time. It's just, yeah, it really disturbed me. Uh, and actually, th uh, there's a link, I'll post a link down below. I actually shared this with Top Fives. He does like paranormal things, it's a really good channel. You should check out if you're into the supernatural and paranormal. Anyway, on with the repair. Ouch, yeah, so we've got corrosion down the side of the C1. Some corrosion up there. Corrosion all around here, around these two chips around here as well i'm not sure is that a ram i think it is yeah i think that might be pallet ram or something i'm not sure could be the z80 ram actually because it's pretty close to the z80 yeah i think that's probably what that is the d0 as well crystal uh, it's even got as far as the cpu here actually as well so yeah i'll clean up with some cotton buds and ipa i'll remove the battery the traces here look uh, damaged there's lots of wires affected but we'll just see what it looks like after it's been cleaned up. So all I'm doing initially here is uh, just using IPA and cotton buds. We'll go over this later with some vinegar and stuff. Some of these things are going to come off here. These chips are going to be removed, I think. But initially, I just want to get all the dirt off because there is a lot of dirt on this as well. It isn't just corrosion. You can see it's like black. Well, I've only been looking at this a few minutes, but I'm coming to a fast conclusion, actually. I think this one is going to have to be used for spares. I might just continue cleaning it up just to see how extreme it really is, but uh, I mean, just to show you the traces here, loads of the traces here are damaged, loads of the traces there are damaged. The YM2610, you see corrosion all the way down the side of the 2610. Those are hard to get off the board when you've got perfect traces. So the fact we've got loads of corrosion there, that in its own right is a, is a nightmare repair, just on its own without any of these things. You can see how dull the pins there are, loads of corrosion on both sides, in fact three sides of that chip there, D0. Loads on the C1, all down this side here, very, very green. And lots of these traces here, you can see, you know, the, the traces are gone. And these chips here, the traces underneath them. And all the components around here as well will need swapping out, I would suggest. I might be able to clean one or two of these up, but yeah, it doesn't bode well, actually. This is the, the main reason why, if you ever get any of these boards second hand, you know, for spares, repair or whatever, remove the blooming battery. That battery's perhaps just been sat around on this for the last uh, however many years it's been sat in storage, and that's the big problem. If that battery would have been took off at the point it was, you know, last bought by somebody, maybe wouldn't have so much damage here now. Anyway, I'll get a load of IPA, toothbrush, toothbrush, cotton bud, toothbrush. Yeah, so it goes without saying, remove the battery, clean up with vinegar before using IPA really. Make sure the PCB is dry after you've cleaned it, and then obviously just check VCC and ground connections on any affected ICs. So I've had a good clean around there, I need to do more work, but I'll show you what it's doing. Yeah, that's the diagnostics. So I mean, you know, it is booting, it's like the backbone of the system's all right. We've got some clocks, we've got the CPU boot, and it's running some code. It's getting messed up on the uh, addressing of the graphics and stuff there, you know, something's not quite right there. Yeah, so I had a freeze frame in here. You can see every other character appears to be missing. And if you sort of just try and read between the lines there, you can see clearly it does say, you know, BIOS address. There's a problem between A13 and A15, I think. And Gadget from the Future, what I would say, is when you see this, it's you know going to be perhaps something address decoding related, maybe the C1 or the E0, because both those things have a relationship to the ROM output enable. But clearly, we've got enough of an output enable working to be able to actually run the BIOS here. You know, the BIOS is actually booting and running code. And my thought at this point was there's actually more than one fault, and yeah, that's correct. We'll come back to some of that sort of stuff later. But the fact it's missing every other character, you may think that that is what it has the relationship to this A13 to A15 error. They're two different things, I think. With address or date line or something. It could be a clock, you know, it could be related to clocks and things still. So I think the next thing I'm going to do is go over some of those traces with a fiberglass pen, actually, and try and work out where we've got bad traces and where we haven't. So before I even removed the battery, I did have a go at just exposing some of the traces here that were really, really, really badly corroded. 
but on reflection actually after cleaning them up they're not too bad uh, I'll give you a macro in a minute of the areas I've been focusing on here I've just been going around I use the fiberglass pen you can't get the uh, the stuff off the top there you know it's like a crystallized sort of dark gray solid stuff it just doesn't come off the fiberglass pen yeah you're not gonna be able to see it from very well from this distance I'll give you a macro layer very gently in a circle around the exact surface of it and the point where it joins uh, and I've done that for each of these here um, any of the dark patches where it's dark there's a dark bit there I've not done um, just very gently I might even have a break there actually I think there is and all I'm doing is trying to find where there's a break the other thing I'm thinking about doing if we can work out where the trace is or at least just clean it up a bit like this I'll remove the battery next that's the next thing I'm going to do and I'll pull the uh, cover off underneath it's just like a piece of red foam or something that's stuck there so that I can inspect the underside what I might do is remove the two SMD chips here and these three dip chips and I'll probably use hot air I think get it nice and toasty until the chip is definitely free you know because if you try and start trying to force one of these off even just using you know the even the through hole ones you start using the desolder pump you'll find the solder just doesn't come off and stuff so mm, we could have a challenge getting that off there but i'm thinking yeah i might remove those three or four chips there with hot air obviously i'll remove on the dip chips i'll remove the majority of the solder with the uh, solder pump first the desolder station but then I might just get some hot air and just gradually, one at a time, just remove them so that I can inspect underneath and clean up all around. But there's loads of contamination between the pins and stuff and I just can't help but wonder how bad the pads and things are. But there is a chance removing it, we could actually damage a lot of pads and a lot of traces and stuff. It is a bit of a lost cause, but it's in a much better state than it was, you know, last night when I first started to look at this. I'm surprised actually at how few well, I've not found a single damage trace yet, you know, an actual break. All the ones I've cleaned up, they just need tinning and they'll be good as new. The vias could be the issue. That might be what the issue is, you know, that the traces all look all right, or maybe on the top side, on the bottom side, but maybe we've not got a connection between the top and the bottom side through the vias. So all I've done here is just leak some IPA along the top in order that it can help free up the adhesive and just uh, carefully, you know, peel it back, but... Yeah, it's going to take some time this. Might need to get some more IPA onto there, I think. So we're on macro here now. You can see this discoloration. This is the battery acid that's mixed with the IPA. So I'm going to need to neutralise this and, you know, clean over it again. Well, this is what I was hoping to see on this side. Can you see? Sorry, it's hard to point. We've got some bad vias and things on this side as well. Yeah, we've got some here. Can you see the vias look dark? Look at those down there as well, pins on that chip. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look uh, anywhere near as bad on this side. Uh, I'll remove the battery next and then just clean up around here. I mean, look over here as well. Yeah, so around the D0, not too bad. There's a few pins around there. See those vias up there? They need doing. But I need to continue cleaning up those traces and vias there. You can see we've still got some dirty vias and there's a few bits of the traces still not cleaned. And there are my nailers got a via there that needs cleaning all the ones up there need cleaning some down there above the C1 you can see the ones I did just down here on the bottom of the C1 they weren't as bad as I thought but look at the pins the pins on this C1 here yeah very green I'm sorry it's not focusing so well they're not too bad I mean there's obviously there's one right down the, the side here of the Yamaha we've got you know the pins still looking a little bit green the ram is going to need to come off, I think. But actually, it's not bad, and I, ha I actually haven't found an actual break. You know, and again with these two, I think these dip chips are going to have to come off. Can you see? Very green. So yeah, it's the things underneath. You know, it's traces underneath. It could be affected. The crystal's got a bit of uh, corrosion on it there. One, or, I think I saw one pin on the CPU. Looks a bit green. So we get the battery off now absorbs but I'm just going to pull the battery from the other side at the same time as we uh, eat the pads up which is very gently because remember the pads and traces and things on the other side are in a pretty sorry state so uh, yeah there, it's coming off pretty easy that there we go it's free on that side let's do that one there we go it's just fallen off nasty battery removed so I'll continue uh, cleaning up around here and uh, give you a bit of a progress update in a minute 
So I think maybe we've got a data bus clash or something. I don't know, it's very odd. The fact it can't, you know, it's got this BIOS, uh, is it A12 to A15 or whatever, address problem. And the fact we're missing the second character. It's like we've got the first one, we miss one, get one, miss one, get one, miss one. I'm thinking, you know, the first thing was like the UDS LDS. I thought, well, let's just check that, you know, to the C1. Connectivity's there, so we're not missing, it's not like we're missing one and a half there or something like that. The address lines, again, that was the other obvious thing. You know, done connectivity tests from those upper address lines, A15 all the way down to A10. They connect to the 68000, no problem. So I think the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove these, actually. We can socket them up, but we can inspect underneath. But at the same time, as I can test without, that 04, I'm not sure what that's for. Is that the one that's that ties to the latch that feeds the backup RAM signal into the HC32 here? Is that what that 04's for? Is it the 04 faulty? Would the 32 cause this? I don't think it would, actually. Although there is one gate on that 32 where uh, that's independent from the rest of the system. It could be that that's faulty. Yeah, so I'm going to, like I say, I'll remove these within soldering station and we'll just give it a try. So you can see I've cleaned up around here. Uh, I've tinned everything up and stuff. There were a few wires that weren't great, but nothing that was uh, obvious actually in terms of, you know, causing a fault. So I'm going to get uh, two new sockets on there and I'll just get, I'll try replacement uh, chips actually. Out of interest, I tested without them on there exactly the same behavior so you know even without those chips so you can rule out them uh, uh, causing a problem in one way but if let's say one of the gates is not working on there that might be the actual cause of the problem so you know if that gate is now fixed maybe it will work again so you see what I'm trying to say yeah it's one of those so I've been just checking around the data bus and I was looking at these two four fives in particular and if you look at the A8 pin uh, on that one there can you see it's just pulsing low and on the one below, it's pulsing properly. You know, toggling between high and low, and it's the same with all the other pins on both chips, actually. So it's like we've got one stuck, well, not necessarily stuck, but it's only showing low, which is a bit weird. That would suggest to me something's wrong with that 245, actually, because if we look at the other side of it, we can see it's pulsing. So we're not getting a transition to a high there. Now that is only on the pallets, but, I'm wondering if this if this is actually leaking onto the data bus actually, you know, there's something wrong with this chip and it's interfering with the uh, data bus. And with the CPU, if we start with the first data bit, fourth one down there, it's pulsing, next one up, stuck low. Uh, all the other pins, including all the ones down the other side here, the upper uh, ones, they're all pulsing. So it's like we've got a stuck bit on the CPU. Now that isn't the bit that corresponds to the bit down here on the 245. In any case I'm going to remove that 245 because I think that 245 is faulty actually. So that didn't solve my problem. The bit is still there. Now with the chip off everything looks looks okay but just following the connections, the uh, that second pin there, the A8 pin or whatever as we're looking at, goes to the third pin along here on the 273. And the one below it, it's uh, the second to end pin there, goes to the third pin below. So I'm thinking that 273, but I don't think this is causing the, the actual fault we're seeing. It might do for lucky. So I'll remove that 273 and we'll just see what happens then. So there's lots of different directions that could go in here, including getting the scope onto it, but it's clear that there is a clash somewhere. You know, just from the behavior, the actual error makes no sense. You know, the fact that it's going on about the ROM upper address, we're getting like a character, miss a character, got a character, miss a character with some graphical corruptions and weird things. It's almost like, if I was to guess, that there's a data bus problem somewhere. You've got a clash, some contention, two things, on the data bus at the same time. So I thought let's just check the chip select actually of the RAM. And if I switch this on and I just show you, pin 22 I think it is. So that RAM there, you can see that's low, so that's enabled, it's active low. That one, active low. So they're gonna be in the same block, but the surprise is down here, active low, it's enabled. Same down here. So 
that in its own right is a big problem. The fact we, it's on all the time, but also the backup ramp and the work ramp are enabled at the same time. That's crazy. So that's one issue, and then I start thinking, okay, well, maybe the C1, you know, that's that's in the area of the corrosion over there. But just step, taking a step back, just going back to what I covered in the previous video when I did a, a backup ram repair, I'll post a link to that diagram down below. But this page of the service manual here with the uh, the C59, the, the latch, I thought, let's just check the outputs here, you know, the shadow, you know, it's got three outputs, shadow, pallets, and the backup ram enable. There's also a system uh, one as well that goes through there, but I was interested to see whether there was an issue with the pallet, the shadow, and the backup ram enable. And actually, yeah, I'm shocked actually there is. So pin 11 is the backup ram enable, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So you can see that the 259 is actually enabling the backup ram. Uh, and then the next one up, pin 12, is the pallet. You can see that's also enabled and uh, pin 10, 9, 10, system that's enabled, uh, what was the other one? Yeah and the other one is the shadow which is pin 4 uh, and if we go around to, I can just rotate that pin 4 here, that's enabled, everything's enabled, that's just crazy uh, those I would assume those would need to be enabled at different points in time actually because the CPU can write and well maybe, yeah I think you can it can write the pallet via the 245 we just swapped out down there just to rule that out I think that's a red herring that bit that's showing as a, an incorrect state or whatever I think that's something to do with the the value that's actually been written to the pallet so I could be wrong but I, yeah I think that explains that I don't think there's an issue there it might not be the 259, it could be something else, you know, this could be getting duff information and latching on everything. But the signs would suggest, I have looked at the inputs and we've got pulsing on all four or five of the inputs, you know, it's like four address bits, I think, and then a bit to set it, I think, if memory serves. It could, again, you know, that something like that could be caused by the problem we see in any way, you know, so it might not be the fault is the point I'm trying to make. If you you know if you've got um, problems with your data bus and you're writing weird things to weird places, that could be accidentally latching all of those on. But let's rule it out. So I pulled two five nine off next. So in terms of where we're at, I've removed the C one because we're still getting nowhere here. And I also removed the the ram from over here because I wanted to ascertain whether there was any damage on the vias and things here. And as you can see, they look okay, but there was some corrosion. I've cleaned them up. You can see they look a little bit coppery. The pads are all really super good. Some work needs to be done on the vias here again, just to scratch up and also test connectivity on both sides. Make sure the vias are passing on both sides. It's a bit dirty. There's muck and all sorts on here. I need to finish tinning the traces here. Uh, I can perhaps show you that in a minute. Example of how I've uh, how I've been doing that. Clean off some uh, flux and stuff from up here as well. I might remove the D0 yet in the same way that I've done the C1. D0 is a little bit easier because the pin density is slightly less. That is a lot more I think. So my suspicion at the moment is a stuck address bit on the CPU. What I don't understand is why the text is doubling. That would suggest to me problem with the LSPC I think or maybe the RAM associated with it. Maybe if we could get further into diagnostics past the ROM error we may then get a RAM you know maybe a slow RAM or something like that error. But I've opened up the question to the Neo Geo community including Furtech just to see what you know they've they think if anybody's seen that error before, you know, not really the error. So much. Well, yeah, the error, because the ROM, you know, the BIOS address error would certainly suggest an address problem. Or, you know, it can't be the data bus because it wouldn't be booted. You wouldn't be running code from here if there was one data bit missing on there. Well, I think it's very unlikely. So, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. I might just double check all the data and address bit connections again between the CPU and the ROM, just in case I've missed something because that could be a simple part of the problem. And I would suggest that maybe that would cause the problem we're seeing with the, the LSPC actually, you know, if you've got an address problem here, it's running the wrong code, maybe we'd see something like that, I don't know, I doubt it. It'd be too much of a coincidence, I think. But right now I'm gonna finish, I'll clean up around here. Uh, we'll get the C1 back on, I'll show you the fit in that perhaps. Uh, we'll socket up the 6116 here. 
So there's a bunch of link wires I need to add there for the uh, 6116 for the Z80. Bear in mind, it's kind of it's not relevant. These aren't going to be fixing the problem here. But if I manage to get the board up and running, it will mean that the Z80's got a good chance of you know working from the go. The YM2610 will need removing. I found a, a damaged trace going to the corner of it, and the pins are very green. So I'd be amazed if that YM2610 has not got a few damaged connections on it. So I will do one more connectivity test before I commit to solder the socket on. But I'll show you what I've been doing here just to send this up and it's, uh, yeah I've shown this many times on the channel. Uh, just use some desolder braid with a bit of solder already on it. Get some good flux on the board. I'm using the chip quick stuff here at the moment. And just drag, you know, heat up and very carefully drag the braid over. Can you see we've turned that pad up and the trace that led to it. There. Any of the ones that I've exposed, and that's what I've done. I've you know, I've scratched off the uh, corrosion from anywhere that's affected. It is time consuming this, but it will mean that the corrosion, you know, won't start eating the bare copper. But the reason you want to check connectivity afterwards, after you've done something like this, is because obviously these, you know, the pads and the traces could be on the last legs so whilst you've got a good connection before you tinned it you may find that after adding some heat and dragging some braid over that you know that little bit of conductivity is gone depends you know how disintegrated they are you see what I mean so apologies for the rain I'll just show you hopefully you'll be able to hear this if we probe the uh, vias down here they lead to the wires here. Say sure, sure, sure. Yeah, all the way along here. In that, uh, it's like a V shape here. That's the Z80 data bus actually. It's passing through the C1. And you can confirm the same thing by probing up here actually. There you go, so that's one of the data bits. I'm probing on the 6116 here. So move along to the next one. Next one. Then I think we've got a ground or a supplier rail at the top corner. So then we go down here. The next one. So the only other connection around here that's bad is one of the ones down here. The, uh, the wire on the top side here is just totally corroded away. So what I'm going to do here is just, uh, if I can find it, find the wire and uh, clear it out with a pin. Now this probe is super fine, I've done this from both sides. And then when you've done that, strip back the end of some kind of like that, really long, uh, and push it straight through. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push it through on this side, solder it on the other side, yeah? You know, so the covering's up to the edge of the board, solder it from the other side of the wire, uh, and then just lead it to there and solder it on. The only other alternative is obviously to solder it here and then somehow attach it to the chip. Now, if I'd not put the socket on, I could perhaps attach it to the leg, then stick the socket on, but I'd forgotten to do that. And I don't want to solder it to the actual chip because, you know, you need to be able to remove the chip, not solder wires and things from it. So that's what I'm going to do. But I've cleaned up the traces and wires and things around here as you can see. Tested connectivity to the other side, it's all okay. So we're at the point where I think I should stick the C1 back on. So before I stick this back on, I need to get some desolder braid on the underside of the pins here. Remove all the, you know, the solder. Clean it up with some IPA, you can see it's looking pretty dirty that actually. Put it on a flat surface and then use something flat to just make sure the pins are flat. It's better than magnifying glass. Check the corner pins in particular. Get it back on there with regards to uh, pin one marking, which I think is over here. Pin one's over there, so the uh, notch will go up there. So I've cleaned up with some IPA. There were two pins that I just need to very carefully bend out, which I've done, you know, because they're on the corner points. They just got a bit pushed a little bit when I was trying to remove it with a hot air there. And then we'll use, uh, yeah, an EV block <laughs> ruler or something similarly flat with a flat edge just to press down like that. Get really nice flat edges there. That's it. So I'll inspect that, get it on the board, uh, align it up, inspect it, 
and tack down the opposite corners. So hopefully you can see that's totally straight. We've got one pin down here uh, on the bottom left hand corner, uh, not on this row but on the side row there. Just needs moving down a tiny tiny smidge. But uh, all we'll do now, like I say, is tack this corner, try not to touch the pin, as I've shown in previous videos, touch the pad with some solder and flux, let it flow to the pin, inspect, do the same thing, top, top corner here, and then we'll drag solder on the, the sides maybe, and then do the top and bottom. So apologies for the rain, it's, uh, it's not let up today at all. And all I'm gonna do here is uh, just gently, at a distance, it's hard for me to do this on camera, just drag down there like that. And I'll have to inspect with the magnifying glass now because I can't see anything from this distance. Can you see the pins on the bottom there are really grey? Now the ones on this side were horrendous, are like really dark. Just get some, uh, again, some desolder braid with a tiny bit of solder already on it. And this flux, which sometimes you get flux wedged on the underside there, and I can see, if I look through the magnifying glass, I can see some flux, even though I've reflowed this uh, a couple of times and I've used the IPA and I've used the toothbrush, there's like big chunks of flux on the underside there, which I don't want there. Um, so you kill two birds with one stone with this, just heat and drag the solder braid like this. You may see some of the flux burn off as we go along here. See there? That's where it all was on the left hand side. And it was the old original flux, you know, I couldn't get it off, even with the toothbrush when the chip was off the board. It just wasn't coming off. I mean, I could have soaked it, I've used that technique in the past, soaked the chip in a cap with some IPA for half an hour. That will get any of that old crusty flux off. But can you see that? It's, uh, yeah, brought it up like new, coated it with solder, so the corrosion that was around there has kind of been dealt with. So it has been pretty thoroughly cleaned there, but but because I've just, uh, you know, done some more soldering on there, you know, dragging that braid over, we'll just give it one last clean here, and you can see the process. Just in case you're using a toothbrush, you can go, you know, in and out of the pins, up and down like that. Uh, just to, you know, make sure you get as much, if not all, of that flux off. That's it, I can tilt the board, uh, and we can just use a paper towel here to absorb that. And then we want to inspect super close. You want to make sure you've not got a short there. I think when I fitted one of these before on one of my uh, earlier videos, uh, I did have a short. Now at the time I had a fuse, and the fuse protected uh, the system actually because the fuse blew. I must have had a short between VCC and ground somewhere on there because the pins are quite close to each other, if not next to each other. So do inspect thoroughly to make sure you've not got any bridges. So we'll give that a try now, you can see we've got some good solder points on there, it almost looks factory. Uh, the corner points perhaps need a bit of a solder removing there, but that's not too bad. Yeah, in general, it's uh, it's not too bad actually, the recovery. You can see I use two different sockets here, and you said height difference. It's totally flat and straight on the board, it's just the height of the sockets are different. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've got one trace there to fix the chip select, I think, for this. But this is going to make no, have the work done here, it's going to make no difference, I don't think, to the faults. I need to do some more cleaning up around here yet and remove some of these and stuff. But we'll just give it a try now to make sure it's at least the same state it was prior to me removing the C1. So, yeah, it's just the same after doing all the work around here. I'm going to shift my attention to the CPU next because I don't understand how it can't read the ROM correctly. As far as I understand, that ROM check there is done purely register to register, I think. It's not using the backup RAM or the work RAM to store program code or to store the, you know, the, the values that it's reading from the ROM in order to check that it can, you know, uh, address the ROM correctly. Because I think that's what it's trying to do. It's, 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 it's doing like an address check, but it's part of the CRC check it does of the ROM to make sure that the ROM contents are correct, that you can read all of the ROM before it starts all the other tests. I think that's what's going on. So I can't see what else would be clashing with the addressing of the ROM, actually. The address bits on here, the address connections, their outputs on everything else connected to it their inputs so it's very unlikely that you know any say you know a, a, a an address connection to something had failed which would cause the cpu to not be able to address the, the rom that's really unusual i'm sure it's possible it's feasible but i don't think so 
So I'm thinking the CPU, so I'll go around this with the solder station first and remove as much solder as possible and then I'll use some hot air to free it up. I've done that with all of these actually, I didn't show it. If you look back at some of my previous MVS repairs there, uh, I'll perhaps post a link down below to what I mean. Uh, or up as a card up here. Um, yeah, you know, I've used the desolder station to remove most of the solder and then just freed up with hot air. We still need to consider removing the D0, which I will do anyway as part of the cleanup work, because I'd like to do what I did with the C1, you know, remove that. We'll have to remove the Yamaha still to clean up under there. But let's just hope the CPU at least fixes the ROM issue. We may have a faulty LSPC, that might be the next thing. Um, you know, the thing with the graphics there, missing every other character. But that could be because it's not able to read the correct code from the ROM or something like that. But I don't think so, because it is outputting, you know, it's, it's, it seems to run the right code there. It's just missing every other character. I don't need to spend too long preheating on the underside. Just maybe a minute or two. And I'm going to focus on, can you see there's like the pin there? It's like a, probably a VCC or ground connection on the other side where it's uh, not freed up and there's a couple here I think on this side just one there I think and there might be one near the top I'm not sure hopefully it should come off fairly easily this but if we preheat on the underside then flip it over it'll just make it a bit easier and doing this we've got least risk of damage to the board yeah, so on a chip this large, as you can imagine, it was painful to get it off this way. It did take a good 15 minutes, if I'm honest. Just gradually levering slightly from each side of the flat bladed screwdriver, eventually it came off. So that did take a number of minutes, but as you can see, you know, we've got no pad damage there whatsoever. We've just got a couple of holes from block now where the uh, solder was not freeing up, you know, which is why I've used hot air to free it up. Well, there's no point in even showing you. It's exactly the same with a different CPU. This is actually a 16 megahertz. It's the HC version, so it's the right type. It's just faster. They're supposed to use a 12. So I'll uh, clean up the pins on the old one, stick the old one back in. That is a surprise. So what on earth is causing this problem? The only thing I can think is something to do with clocks. Maybe the D0 is the problem because there is some corrosion there. So I think the next thing I'm going to do, once I've put the old CPU back in this socket here, I mean the socket was the most expensive part so far, it's about £3 or something for that 64 pin shrink dip socket there. But it was worthwhile, I mean I needed to test this 68000 actually because I've had it for quite a while, I don't even know whether it works or not. At least I know now my CPU is probably alright, so yeah I think we'll remove the D0 next. So having a go at removing the D0 now, I should have done this before, removed that CPU really, but yeah, I mean I had a hunch, but yeah, there we go, I'm not always right. I don't understand what else could be causing it other than a clock problem actually. Uh, I mean it does look like we've got a problem with the LSPC or something around the graphics side, the fact we're missing every other character, but that could be clock related as well, so maybe the D0 is the answer to this. What I could do is just take one of the D0s off one of the uh, AX boards I've got here to look at yet. We aren't really levering it, we're just trying to assist lifting it when it's reached temperature. Some people will get these things up to temperature where you can just tap the chip with a screwdriver and it floats around, but if you do that you're applying more heat. I actually don't like that technique myself. You want to use the least amount of heat possible, but at the same time not risk damage in the board. So, yeah, there's a trade-off between uh, heating long enough and you know before you try and just slightly lift it if it's ready. It's coming off. It's nearly there, I think. There we go, just flip that over. So whilst the D0 could be faulty, I'm gonna reapply it. We can always remove it and swap it out from one of the ones from another board later. So it's in the right position. As I say, don't touch the chip or the board. Touch the pad, add the solder to the pad. It flows to the pin, don't touch the, the chip. Again, touch the pad, try and add the solder up 
you see that's what happens if you touch the chip uh, it's just yeah let me add, add some solder on there hang on what I'm going to need to do now is heat it and just touch the chip try and move it like that yeah then inspect yeah and that's okay so the other thing I then did is uh, put your thumb down heat one pin you can you know just make sure it's flat let it cool down and then heat the other pin as you're pressing it down as well so that it's as flat as it possibly can be then inspect and I found this the second pin along here just needs moving a tiny 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 bit to the right all the other pins are perfectly aligned so then we'll just uh, drag solder like I did earlier so you've got a little bit of solder on the tip there got some flux as you see just drag along like that and it's super easy you'll often see me going the other way I like to dab into them like this even after I've done the drag soldering on this type of chip because you then get nice even uh, distribution on the solder it's going to vary depending on the flux and stuff you're using but hopefully you can see how easy that is it's took you know a few seconds to do one side it's not an issue but you see it's, I don't understand how it can run the first part of the diagnostics it's like something's going wrong at a certain point into the diagnostics there I don't know I might just remove this RAM because I don't think it needs to be there at this point in time actually Well, it's hard to believe, I think I made a little bit of progress. I'm not sure it's going to solve all my problems. Um, I was cleaning up with uh, cotton buds and stuff, and LSPC, pin, two, two pins here are like joined, the bent. So you're on macro there, can you see? The end pins, I suspect that's causing the problem with the LSPC. I'm just not sure whether that's going to make any difference to the address issue we've got. So I was checking the connectivity between the C1 and the 68K uh, just to see if I'd missed anything obvious and I noticed that AS and I think it was UDS it could have been LDS, I'm not sure, was shorted I measured on the CPU and there was a dead short and I measured on the C1 and there was a dead short now the pins were next to each other I inspected them, I couldn't see a join at all I reflowed, you know, put some flux on there, resoldered them there was still a short I did it a couple of times, it's still a short, so I thought it must have failed, that must be the fault. So then I, I spent quite a while getting the chip off, the first time it came off within a few minutes, it took me about six minutes to get that off last night. And after I removed it, measured on the board, the short's gone, measured on the chip, the short's gone. So, but the behaviour was the same, so I don't understand, it's almost like we've got an intermittent short between a couple of the pins there. That's really unusual. So it's left me with a dilemma now of, well now the short's gone, shall I put it back on again and see what's happening now? I'm not sure, I don't have a spare C1 anywhere, I'd have to take one from one of my working boards and I'm reluctant to do that actually, they're in storage. I'll uh, yeah, I'll clean up here, clean up the underside of that and just quickly give it a test. Uh, I'm just going around, I've gone around with cotton buds and I'm just cleaning the sides of the main ASICs here, you know, the uh, B0 LSPC and some of the smaller ones as well, like the F0 and E0 and stuff. And this is a good example why I'm doing this. Can you see this? We've got a corroded pin here. In fact, there's two corroded pins. So I need to get a little bit of flux on there and reflow that. I think it's game over for this board. The D0 was the one that had a faulty uh, clear, I think it was, and there's an 80 side. Okay, it's the C1. So I had to bring part one to an end. There's going to be part two and a part three, I think, actually. Will we get this board working? Will I even survive editing to get to part two and part three? I honestly don't know. There were a number of mistakes in this video, as you saw. I left them in. So things like the work RAM and the VRAM, you know, addressed at the same time. I was looking at the chip select, not the output enable. But that same technique actually comes back in the next part, I think. And it was a similar thing with that latch. So there's me thinking the sort of active uh, low you know, signals for the outputs. They're not, the highs. <laughs> They've got to be high to be actually selected. Anyway, I do hope you survived that video. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next part.